big securing your Bitcoin masterclass from Phil. Um, and he also talked a little bit about the privacy aspect in the Q&A. Uh, we're going to dive deep into uh, privacy in this panel. First off, we have a killer panel here. And also, no photos for this one. Um, just in, in, respect general, privacy. Yeah, respect <laughs> privacy. As a general rule of thumb, like, I, I ask that nobody ever takes a picture like, of the audience. Generally, like, the panelists are, are cool with photos, but in this case, not. So please, no photos. Or definitely no photos. <laughs> um, all right, so first off, I just want to introduce all these guys. I'll have them introduce themselves. We'll start with Ben here. Um, I'm Ben. I run the Austin BitDevs meetup here and has been a Bitcoin open source contributor for like four years now, I think. Yeah. Paul, I am. Oh, can you hear me? No. Can you turn it off? Oh, okay. Is this thing on? Hello. Hey, uh, I'm Paul. I'm a front end developer. I work at, at Voltage, which does like hosted, hosted lightning stuff. Not very private. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Tony. Um, I do a lot of uh, lightning stuff in the space for several years now. And right now just um, kind of doing my own thing as an independent. Oh yes. As you can see, it's sponsored by Waterloo. <laughs> uh, all right. So first off, I think I just want to get started by talking um, in, in a general sense about privacy and, uh, you know, if whoever wants to take this one, I mean, the relationship between privacy and freedom and, and what makes privacy so important. I, um, I'm, is, is, who here knows of the, the third party doctrine? Has anybody heard of this? No? Show of hands? Seriously? No, I, have I have a feeling okay. we're about to. I have an idea. Okay, 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 yeah. This I'm, is great. We're I, looked, I looked this up on the internet, um, so I know all about it. Um, this is from Wikipedia. The, the third party doctrine is a United States legal doctrine that holds that people who voluntarily give information to third parties, such as banks, phone companies, internet service providers, and email servers, doesn't say this, but also Coinbase, have, <laughs> have quote, and this is a legal doctrine like upheld basically by the Supreme Court, have quote, no reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. A lack of privacy protection allows the United States government to obtain information from third parties without a legal warrant and without otherwise complying with the Fourth Amendment prohi prohibition against search and seizure without probable cause and a judicial search warrant. So in our physical lives, like in your house, the government has pretty strong constitutional, um, uh, the opposite, uh, prohibition of, of, of breaking into your house for no reason and looking at what you're up to and, 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 and yeah, and creeping on you. Um, but they basically have, have sneakily given themselves this backdoor legal doctrine to any, anything that you do with a third party, which is basically everything you do on the internet, um, that, isn't, that you don't do in a cypherpunk, uh, cypherpunk or like end-to-end -end encrypted way, Everything is fair game for the government. And as we saw with the Snowden leaks, they have <laughs> really enjoyed that privilege. I think one example that I've heard of recently, too, was, um, you know, uh, when you and to extend that further, when you go to uh, when you get electricity, when you get an energy bill, when you sign up for utilities to have like everyone needs utilities. Right. Um, but those companies are also part of that. And ICE has like collected so much data from these companies in that way to like go after anyone they want in a warrantless way if they if they you know search these records and try to find you so like um, you know trying to seek privacy in this day and age like there's kind of a mantra that's like you know we have a right to privacy um, you know we don't uh, we have I think like a right to seek privacy and the right to like retain the data and information that we have that we hold like we aren't forced to give it up but we're kind of forced to give it up in this day and age because. We need utilities. We need a cell phone. We need uh, basic things like a bank, at least in this modern day world. So um, it's 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 pretty messed up that uh, you know all of our information is just out there all the time um, that the government can just grab and and use in whatever way with with absolutely with this like I didn't know that was the term for it, but yeah, with this with this doctrine, kind of do whatever they want with that data. Yeah, I, I've actually heard of that before. The way it started was because. Um, it was in like the 50s, like pre-internet and everything. There was like a girl being um, stalked on a, by like some guy and he was like calling her and she wanted it to stop. So she like called the police and uh, 
basically the, they like were like okay let's just talk to like Verizon or whatever the phone company was and they were like oh we need a warrant and then like they took it to court and eventually they're like well using the, your service we can just get it from you and then like basically that from like 60 or 70 years ago has now been precedent to like oh I need this phone guy who's or this guy's number who's stalking me to now like show me all your financial transactions and you know show me all these their private photos and all this stuff so it's gotten a little out of hand yeah it's a huge deal and especially again you know if if the you know a transaction itself that's there's a ton of data in that transaction like everything about you and you know we have had access to cash for the longest time but it seems as though um, cash is sort of on its way out uh, a lot of businesses don't accept it uh, more governments are posturing saying like we're going to do away with cash entirely so then that means absolutely zero uh, financial privacy but I guess before we get uh, a little into that it's like well what is the big issue with like one company or group of companies, let's just say like excluding, excluding the government, having like all this data, like just for, for everyone out there in terms of saying hacks or, or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, hacks is like a big one too. Like um, all, uh, every company collecting data, I mean, there's kind of a joke that um, there's like two ki kinds of companies, one that has like gotten hacked and one that they don't know about it yet. Um, and so all, all these companies are huge honeypots of information. And it's one thing, like, if a, if a company has some of this data and they're, you know, they're not trying to do anything unethical, they're not trying to be a Google and run AI on all of our data or try to analyze our behaviors and stuff. Like, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but just in privacy in general, like, you know, there's this kind of, um, you know, people think a little shady about people that are trying to talk about privacy or want privacy is like, well, what do you have to hide? What are, are you a criminal or something? Are you doing something bad? And it's, it's not about that at all. There's basically, I, I think there's like three facts that I think we can all agree on that, that we all have um, things that we care about and want to protect loved ones or things that we're trying to protect and care about. Um, and another fact that we all have weaknesses in this world. We're vulnerable in some way. Um, you know, in some ways we know about, in some ways we don't. Um, and then the third fact is that as long as there, there's bad people in this world, which I think there's always going to be bad people in this world, um, they're going to want to exploit anything that they can for their own personal gain. So it's it's not it's it's about protection. Right? At the end of the day, privacy is about protecting yourself. It's about protecting the people that you love about um, the bad guys that are trying to hurt you, and whether we're talking about the government or whether we're talking about some hacker on the internet, um, it kind of all comes down to that. And for what it's worth, like, you know, we, we were demoing uh, hardware wallets. You know, Ledger had a big leak where if you bought a device from the Ledger website, uh, all your information, your address, your phone number, so now anybody that has access to that, which it was opened up entirely, now know where you live, your phone number, your email, your name. So they could, there's phishing attacks, um, or they could just show up with the $5 wrench attack and, hey, I know you have Bitcoin. And that's also where multi-sig is very important, by the way. Um, but I, yeah, I, if, if you think of like that justification that Ben brought up for why we even have the third-party doctrine, it's like, well, we, we need to spy on people to be able to keep some people safe. And that usually is like that, the justification. But yeah, it ex exactly leads to this. We need, we need people to keep safe. So we need to know all this information about them and store them in a centralized honey pot. And then it gets hacked and then it gets used by bad people against the people that we're, we're trying to keep safe in, in the first place. So it, it, it doesn't work for its, its stated goal. Absolutely. Um, let's kind of circle back to financial privacy and CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. They, um, you know, they want to go kind of entirely <laughs> cashless. And it's this illusion of like, where well, everything's going to be like so easy and like everybody's going to be able to send digital payments. Um, well, maybe let's just kind of highlight some of the negative, you know, things that could arise from that uh, in a cashless society. I mean, I think it'll be like not really different from the current financial like fiat system. Like it'll still always still be swipe your credit card, you know, you get some in your Zelle payment, blah, blah, blah. Just be, instead of using Swift and Fed uh, wires, it's just CBDC stuff. But like, it's just going to exacerbate the more problem, the problems we have today where inflation will be easier, easier to hide, and transactions will be like much easier to censor. So instead of like calling up JP Morgan and be like, hey, you should shut down Ben Carmen's bank account, they can just press a button and do it themselves kind of thing. 
So it's just going to get, you know, worse in that regard. But from like the current system, it's like, it's basically the same thing. There's not gonna be like any new stuff. And what's the uh, operation choke point or whatever, where the Obama administration decided like, we don't like guns. So let's uh, use the banking system to sort of deplatform gun shops. So we, we're not going to do anything that breaks the Constitution, not going to create any laws or anything. We'll just use this third-party system to just deplatform. And if you don't have a banking, if you can't buy and sell, you become pretty much removed from... It's not just like... Uh, it's not just Banking isn't just a nice-to-have, especially with digital money. Like Most people, that's what they need to survive. So you're kind of removing the right of certain people to survive if they do a thing that you don't like. And I think CBDCs will just be that more efficiently. <laughs> and it's not just like a right versus left issue here where that's like, you know, the left attacking the right over guns, but it happens in the inverse too, where like all through, like if you go like to Colorado and try to buy marijuana, every shop only takes cash because they can't, they won't, they can't take uh, credit cards because no one will let them bank with them. And so like they have huge problems where it's like, they have like a hundred thousand dollars in, in a safe, in, like in back there. And people can like, they're terrified people are going to rob them and stuff. So it's like, it's a security issue for these people, too, of, like, not being able to have banking. And it's all just because they can't, like, privately own money digitally. And, and to take that point even further, I mean, being worried that, like, someone's going to come in and try to rob the safe, um, especially at the beginning of the legalization in, in Colorado, it was the government, the federal government itself coming in and robbing these shops, take, seizing everything and, and taking, um, taking everything they had. So it was... You know, we're, we're in this kind of situation now that it's, it's really funny to like kind of observe. Uh, we're still in that area where, where weed is illegal at a federal level, but all, you know, a lot more states have like started giving access to it. And, you know, like uh, almost to turn it around and like, OK, well, what are we going to do um, when Bitcoin is made illegal? Are, are we going to comply with that or are we going to um, kind of look at the lessons learned from um, Colorado and, and some of the weed industries that have had to dealt with this? Um, because it's it's it, it could happen. Yeah, and I, I think you know one of the key things here too is you can either vote at the ballot box, you can vote with your feet, or you can vote with your money. Um, and what if you know the money becomes incredibly politicized, uh, like like uh, Paul was highlighting in regards to the the gun purchasing? Um, you kind of lose that ability to vote with your money if they're going to tell you how you can vote with your money, like, oh, we're going to censor this. I think I heard something about MasterCard testing out or demoing, like, uh, carbon credit, like, you know, cards where you can only accrue, like, you know, you're going to lose so many carbon credits if you buy, like, B for this or that. And it's like, you know, it's kind of, they're just playing around with it, but it's a real possibility. Just on a, a less spooky and terrifying angle of this, you brought up MasterCard. Like, I, I, I think a lot of people have probably heard that thing of, like, a Target knew somebody was pregnant before she did. Like, they're just, they had an algorithm of, like, oh, people who have this spending habit are, you know, probably pregnant. I think you told me one time, like, you need, like, three transactions. Four. Four transactions? Maybe three now, Wait, tell me what four. the thing is. Actually. Yeah, basically, um, there's like four points. And if, if you see, if uh, there's there's a certain point where like our financial transactions, you know, they may say they're anonymized before they send them out to like marketing services and all the third parties that they, you know, they like there's the bank having all these financial records, right? But then they partner with everyone else to give out these data points, but anonymized. And all you really need is just like to take four Transactions. You don't even need to know who did it or or whatever. It's just like some. It's just like some ID, but you can still see who it. Act, like you, if you have that data, you can start to get into like who it actually is that did that and try to um, see. Oh, these uh, these identifiers are like a single person or, or not. Maybe they don't know exactly who you are, but they know like you're you're probably like the same person. Like no one else in the world has. When you think about all the transactions you make in a day. Um, an average person like has some repeatability, like maybe on Tuesdays, I like to go, you know, to, to Starbucks and Chick-fil-A and a few other places at specific times. I'm, I'm like the only person in the world to do those unique things. Um, and anonymized data isn't as anonymized as, as you think you, uh, as you think it may be. And at the very best, it's being used to market to you, which is in some sense, kind of another attempt to control you. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with all this being said, mm -hmm. There's a lot of hope, like uh, whether, you know, many of us in this room are very principled or, you know, there's a lot of people out of the world that are kind of becoming increasingly principled in some, to some degree as government overreach ha has increased, right? And the surveillance state has, has kind of, um, you know, really turned on. 
So with that being said, you know, there, there has been pushback, um, whether it's through, you know, laziness or incompetence or government incompetence or whatever. But Bitcoin also provides a way to allow everyone to vote with their feet in a cashless society. It is almost like quite literally, it is the only option of digital cash that exists on this planet that is uncensorable, unconfiscatable, and so on. Um, but Bitcoin privacy is not perfect either, right? And so I do kind of want to touch on, maybe we'll start with on-chain privacy. Um, we'll start there. And, and, and does anyone want to take that one? Hey, ben. Ben's, Ben's doing the most to try to solve on-chain privacy. Yeah, so. I, I guess. I mean, on-chain <laughs> privacy, it's like, it's an everlasting rabbit hole where you start out like we would finish watching Phil's presentation, like, okay, I'm not going to reuse addresses. And then uh, that's like step one of a million. And then, you know, eventually, you know, there's like all these different things you can do um, and like getting to like wallet fingerprinting and coin joining and all this stuff. I mean, it's a very hard problem, but like essentially like what you're trying to do is just not have like one UTXO linked to another. And um, Bitcoin inherently makes that hard, but for good reason, you know, without that, we will not have audibility of um, the chain. So you can verify that like people aren't inflating the supply or anything like that. So that's like extremely important, but the trade-off there is, you know, our privacy is hurt. So taking actions of like things like coin joining and making sure you're not like reusing addresses. And then even like more basic things where just like, don't use something like blue wallet that just gives all your data to, to the blue wallet server, run your own nodes. So you can verify the transactions yourself. So you're not just, again, sharing that party to someone who could just, you know, be uh, saying, or not sanctioned, but like subpoenaed or something and just, or they get hacked and share the data. Yeah, let's just say you wanted to look up that address on a block explorer uh, that, that Phil had, and you access a block explorer from your home IP address. They're like, oh, what, what is this person doing looking at this address? It must be their address. It must be related. And like, so where Ben was talking about the importance of you know, having your own node, running your own node, being able to verify your own transactions. Um, yeah. And it, well, at, at the end of the day, it's like the Bitcoin as a protocol is like, you know, it's pretty robust for, for privacy in terms of, you know, the only thing we can do to kind of protect ourselves from state overreach. But at the individual level, like there's a ton of room for error. It becomes very difficult to, to remain kind of private in some cases. Right. And like, like Ben said, like it, it, it comes down to Bitcoin's need to be auditable. And, and Bitcoin has like a UTXO model that's uh, which I think has come up a couple times, unspent transaction output. So when you send and receive Bitcoin, you're not just going in and out of like a balance. Um, it's just you send, a, a, you create a transaction and some Bitcoin moves into an unspent transaction. Um, and it could go into a bunch of different ones or it could go into one big one. So if, uh, like if you visualize like this as a chain of transactions and like Michael is Coinbase, right? So Coinbase, um, it, that's correlated with uh, KYC. Like your name is correlated with an account on Coinbase. So when Coinbase sends some money, creates a, a UTXO, and it goes to the, the, the bin can be the next UTXO, right? So now that's, that you send it into a multi-sig wallet that you control. This is awesome. Like you are being self-sovereign. You're securing your own keys. You have achieved a lot of the, the benefits of Bitcoin. But um, there is a direct co correlation. That history is just written in the blockchain exactly from the Coinbase at UTXO to they sign a transaction and now it's in this bin UTXO. And so there's an obvious heuristic there of, I think that's bin's money. And so if bin pay, spends it again, it spends it again, like it gets maybe less likely that it's still bin's money. Um, but you know, what Ben was talking about is like something like a coin join where you, you, you put your money into one transaction with a bunch of other people and then there's a bunch of other outputs. Then it becomes a little a little harder to tr trace the the pattern. It can break that link yeah. that you're illustrating. Uh, and again, yeah. there's there's no reason that yeah. you don't you're not trying to evade or avoid, you know, the eyes of the government per se. Or like you're not trying to hide something. You just well maybe you're I mean, not trying to avoid the eyes. You, <laughs> you, you just want to be more private. In right? NPR, that's okay. Yeah, like yeah. I don't 
Like, you know. You're not doing anything illegal. Like, I'm trying to hide my nipples right now, so I wore a shirt. Yeah, like, I don't want the government to know how much Bitcoin I have. I don't want, Paul's a good friend. I don't want him to know how much Bitcoin I have, I have either, though. Like, I just don't want that to be public information. So you do things to protect those. Like, but, the same right, thing. but not even, not even just that. But, I mean, if you go, like, um, you know, Coinbase has uh, their sort of compliance rules of, of what they will allow people um, to do with their money after they leave the exchange or before they enter, if you're if you're depositing money into Coinbase, they do these compliance checks. Um, it's often called chain analytics. Um, so let's you know, even basic things like okay, you know, say you're you're a gambler. You know, there's nothing nothing illegal about gambling. Um, well, maybe some laws you know around it, but um, you're a gambler. You're not hurting anyone. You you you're, you're betting with some friends or a website. You think that the Cowboys are going to win, but they never do. But you're going to bet anyways. Um, and and Coinbase sees that you did a withdrawal. You withdraw. You held your own coins. You know, you're like awesome. That's great. Um, and then you sent it to an address known by a known um, gambling website, they're going to flag your account. And they're going to say that wasn't allowed. Um, they may give you a strike or they may shut down your account. And then there you go. You're, you're unbanked from Coinbase all over again. Um, or you're, you're unbanked. And, and the, the, what you're trying to do with Bitcoin, be able to spend you know, Bitcoin without being censored, well, you're using a service um, not Bitcoin. Like you came from a service and they shut you down. And sure, you were censored, but that wasn't Bitcoin's doing. That was that was the exchange selling you Bitcoin. Um, and and you can have this forward-looking privacy where you actually go and coin join your your UTXOs, um, but you're never going to erase the record that you just bought Bitcoin from Coinbase. That will stay in their system. Um, you know, Coinbase has try to fought some of the overreach that the government has tried to um, coerce them to do, like like give up all the information about all their customers in just like one blind request. Um, they have you know fought on occasion to say like, well, no, we're not, we're not going to actually send you our user data if um, you know it's over if it's under if we're if we're dealing with users that have bought less than twenty thousand because you know we think that's a reasonable measure. Um, but you know they also at the same time um, run their own chain analytics services that 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 they sell to the government. So it's like, well, where did you where did you get that data uh, about all these you know Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin UTXOs? Um, you know where did it come from? Did it come from your customers? So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. You can try to fix privacy going forward, but when you go to Coinbase and you go to these regulated exchanges, just just remember that. You're never going to erase that record, and, and you're on a list somewhere. Yeah, and so, you know, that kind of summarizes the, the on-chain aspect. I mean, somebody could generate a Bitcoin address in the room right now, and I could send it to them, and nobody knows who the receiver was on that end, but there's a good chance, if I'm not uh, doing my best to preserve my privacy, that they would know who the sender is. Uh, now, with Lightning, it, it flips a bit. Um, Lightning, whereas there was Bitcoin on chain is sort of like an ACH transfer that's far superior to the legacy system. Uh, Lightning is kind of like Visa or debit card transactions in a way. Again, far superior uh, and, and decentralized. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, you know, Lightning privacy is kind of reversed. The sender can have a large amount of privacy, but the receiver is the one that has no privacy. Or very right. little, depending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it can get complicated really fast, especially when you're dealing with mobile lightning wallets like like Phoenix or Breeze or um, uh, Moon, even um, where they do are they do have a lot of information. But but with Lightning, there's this there's this fun dynamic where it's like if you don't know much about Lightning, it's a layer two solution. There's a a, a network of nodes, a network of, of participants that all have a payment channel with you know their own individuals and you utilize everyone else's payment channel when you're when you're sending a transaction so if me Paul Ben and Michael all have a channel or I have a, we have a channel with each other here one you know one channel each I send a transaction and it goes through Paul it's like if I gave him a $10 bill and I say Paul can you give this $10 bill to Ben and then and Ben goes can you give this $10 bill to Michael um, you know, it kind of goes in a route. So, you know, Michael has no idea in the end where that $10 bill came from. He knows it, it directly came from Ben, but he doesn't know where, where it came from, from before him. And Ben, Ben knows he's paying Michael, but it's like a, it's like this, like 
envelope system. You know, I mean, Ben doesn't even know Michael was the last participant. Uh, Michael could have gave that $10 bill to somebody else um, and then just keep going. And then meanwhile, Paul, Paul doesn't know that I was the original holder of that $10 bill. I could have gotten a $10 bill from someone else. So that's just kind of like the onion properties, you know, if you're peeling back the onion uh, of the layer um, lightning network, that kind of gives some privacy. But in practice, there's a lot of like, there's a ton of gotchas. Um, and then we're actually working, um, we work as a team um, on a research project that, that we're, we're funded by, uh, by a company for to do um, lightning privacy research in general. And there's just so many gotchas, but at the end of the day, I think it kind of boils down to like me as the sender, I get pretty good privacy, but the receiver doesn't in most cases. I mean, even the example of like, if, 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 if I want to pay Michael over Lightning, you know, he doesn't know my node. He doesn't know where the payment's coming from, but he has to tell me who he is for me to make a payment to him. So, you know, if you ever use Lightning, you have a mobile wallet and you give out an invoice, right? You give out this QR code. Um, you know, it doesn't work in an inverse, right? Like I don't give a QR code to Michael to pay him. He gives a QR code to me. So I scan that with my mobile wallet. And then like a few seconds later, boom, a payment just gets sent instantly to, to Michael. And he has no idea where it came from. But I will always have that record of like, this was Michael's pub key and this was his node. And he requested this much money. And this was the memo of, of the reason why he, 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 he made that transaction or requested that money. So it gets really complicated with Lightning, but that's kind of my short summary of the complications. It, it kind of works like inverse to on-chain, where it's on-chain, the privacy leak is when you are sending, because like, say I'm sending $10 to Michael, I need to like fund that with my own money. So he'll see like, oh, Ben has 10 Bitcoin and he, he sent me $10 with that and then the remaining 10 Bitcoin to him, sort of to myself. But in Lightning, I have all the privacy as a sender and as a receiver, he says, this is where you can send me money. And with that um, pub key where, he's, where I'm sending it, I can go look that up and see like, oh, look, he has 10 Bitcoin worth of lightning channels. You know, Michael's a rich guy. That's pretty cool. Um, but so that's kind of the inverse there where like with lightning, you're kind of doxing yourself as a receiver, but on on-chain, you're doxing yourself as a sender. So. And I think one of the problems is on lightning, you like and on on-chain, we have this idea that we rotate addresses every time. So whenever we show someone a QR code, it's a very unique one. It's a new Bitcoin address every time or, you know, most wallets will do that now. Um, but with Lightning, you typically keep the same pub key, the same node, um, you know, sometimes forever. So that's a little bit of a different dynamic. And like Ben was saying, like that pub key, that kind of address, here's how to get a payment to me so that, you know, Tony can construct this route that, 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 of this onion that pays to you. This address of here, here I am is correlated to an on-chain transaction. So that's when you fall back to all, anything that you know about on-chain privacy that's where the gotcha is. It's like, ah, I see Michael's running this gambling store and I see, or I, I don't know who's running a gambling store, but you're running a gambling store and I see your lightning node. And now I look at, okay, well, what on-chain transactions constructed this lightning node? And then I, you know, I keep, keep following, or I, I think there's probably other ways to de-anonymize you, but that's kind of kind of the plan. Yeah, and that's a perfect segue into Lightning Vortex. Oh, well. So I guess real quick, like, so in order to have a Lightning channel, it all starts on chain, like what Paul was saying. And so tell us about Lightning Vortex, man. So yeah, Lightning Vortex is a project I've been working on for a little over a year now. It's going to release like next week, hopefully. But um, basically the idea is like kind of like we have all these, these like, you know, Lightning, Lightning's biggest problem is Bitcoin or it has to use Bitcoin and that's not very private. So to get around that, let's like use Bitcoin's best privacy practices like inherently with Lightning. So the idea is like, um, what we kind of talked about earlier is like using a coin join is like kind of your best way to do on-chain privacy where like, so just making a transaction to Michael, me and like a th thousand other people all make a, a transaction together and one of it, part of it will pay Michael, part of it will draw the other people want to do. And that makes it so like when he looks at the transaction, he says like, oh, what the hell's going on here? There's like a thousand people in this transaction. So he doesn't know which one was me saying to him. He just knows he's a part of this. So it helps a lot with the privacy. And um, Lightning Vortex basically lets you open Lightning channels in this coin join. So when I want to open a coin join, say to like, to my, or open a channel, say to Michael or to anyone, then when they look at, at the transaction, open the channel to them, they see like, oh, there's just a bunch of stuff here. I don't know 
which one was Ben, and um, it helps you like hide what your previous UTXOs were. So, so like in this example, he was running a gambling site, and you see like, oh, this is all his received things. We just say, okay, look, Michael opened the channel that had coins from a gambling site. Was maybe he just a participant in that, or is the actual runner? And then you know you could do like a thousand coin joints. Now it's eventually just like, well, who knows if that was Michael or not? And uh, it's basically impossible to tell there. And um, that's kind of the core idea. Um, yeah. And again, it's not because I'm trying to evade or do anything illegal. It's just like I want privacy, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a human right. Um, now, okay, like I want to kind of segue back into kind of less technical, more practical. Um, at the end of the day, like pretty much everyone in this room swipes their card. We're all 110% KYC. KYC is know your customer. We've provided IDs to get this debit and credit card, to get this bank account. We are completely KYC'd. Um, so we have effectively no privacy, coming back to the very first start of the conversation, right? So I think a lot of times people will, will make the argument of, now, although Bitcoin could definitely use uh, more privacy, what we currently have is completely broken in terms of privacy. Bitcoin does have ways, although it can, there's a lot of gotcha to dramatically improve your privacy if you're using the tools right. Um, so first off, I mean, it really kind of, in a way, all comes down to the user interface, to the user experience, and you know, what are some things that, that you guys have done or are working on where you can help condense basically everything you've said thus far into a product where it's like, you're not going to screw it up. I, I think the easiest is, it's probably not even like your finances. It's, it's like, get rid of your Alexa, get rid, turn off Siri, like, delete Facebook. Like, those are like the biggest problems that 99% of people are doing. That's like, yeah, you could spend all this time on your Bitcoin tra transaction history, but like, you're doing it right next to your Alexa that listens to every single conversation you've ever had. Like, that is probably worse than, you, you know, you messing up and reusing an address on Bitcoin. And so in terms of like mutiny, yeah, mutiny yeah, yeah. wallet, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you guys want to touch on that. Yeah, we have uh, uh, earlier at, at a hackathon in this, this workspace, uh, we worked on an app called Mutiny. Um, we called it PLN back then, but the whole idea is like I I'd spent, um, I guess like a year and a half ago now, like researching a lot on Lightning privacy and, and all the things that one should do if they were to try to achieve Lightning on, on privacy. And it turned into like one massive like 30 minute um, article um, and at the end of it, I'm like, well, th these are like the 20 things that you need to do if you want to achieve lightning on uh, privacy on lightning. Um, and, and since then, um, me and Paul have like tried to, you know, especially joining, um, you know, getting funded for trying to like research lightning privacy more. And like um, the topic of the thing that we got funded for is called um, how to design a privacy focused lightning wallet. Um, so, you know, we kind of have taken this approach with um, an app that we called Mutiny that we created at this hackathon of like, okay, if we were to programmatically do all the things that like my article a year and a half ago said to do, of like, you know, here's how you open channels, here's how you like send funds, here's how you set up um, your node in the first place, try to seek out and do all those things on behalf of the user while still giving the user the same interface. So if you ever use Moon or Phoenix or any of those apps where it's just like, at the end of the day, you want to send and you want to receive. So how can we make a privacy-focused Lightning Wallet where it still looks like a normal Lightning Wallet, but it does all the best practices on Lightning today? Because there's a lot of ways you can use Lightning. And there's a lot of really cool, interesting things that are like features being developed that like no wallet is utilizing or no wallet is like doing the best in the best way. So we kind of took the approach of like, what would it look like if we did this and try to make it easier for the user? The trick is to just turn off receives. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And literally the wallet as it currently sits in the open source repo, it has no receives. Um, because we didn't think we can do it, do it like comfortably, privately. And, and, I, and that was kind of an interesting experiment in like, I, Bitcoin is so important, this self-sovereignty aspect, that we really, mostly when we're creating software for Bitcoiners, we don't want to remove options. We want to give them as like many options as possible. But I've definitely noticed with privacy that I find it a little psychically noisy. Like, oh shoot, like I haven't memorized, I've read Tony's privacy article three times, but I haven't memorized every single word of it. And so what if 
while in my rush to to buy this coffee with with moon or i do something unprivate somehow you know so if we can remove that psychic burden from it with an app i think that would be really cool I, we still have a long ways to go uh, but i really i, I really want to explore that as a method um but yeah like kind of to ben's point there are also some easy wins and i definitely think it's really important not to let like the perfect be the enemy of the good with privacy like the best privacy you know like you know the best cameras the one you have with you like the best privacy plan is the one that you do like like there's the, the best privacy plan is not the theoretical perfect one where you where you do memorize Tony's privacy article. The best one is the one that you actually day to day can stick to and you can feel comfortable with. And you can like, uh, it's kind of a thing where you can dollar cost average into it. It's like, okay, you know, how can I build a slightly more private way of existing economically just a little bit at a time? Like maybe I'm not ready to delete Facebook yet, but I am ready to get a, a rid of Alexa. So maybe you do one of them and then you do the next one. Uh, and then you kind of slowly move. Like I actually had this where I like, I went too hard and I got like a, um, a graphene OS on an Android phone, like the coolest, most cypherpunk mobile operating system that we have right now. And it felt really great uh, as a win for privacy, but it was a, a real pain in the ass to use. And I felt like it was like actually limiting me uh, to be like effectual as a person. So I like switched to an iPhone and it's like a, it's a real privacy loss. Um, but I didn't want to get to a point where I like was associating like my attempts to be private with just like, I'll just limit my life until I'm nothing, you know, like I didn't want that psychic link. So I, you know, I hope to switch to a great operating system that is actually on my team and trying to keep me safe in the future, but I'm not, I'm not there right this second. Yeah. Like if we, if we, if privacy was our number one goal in life to be the most private people possible, we wouldn't be here right now. So there's like, there's like trade-offs to this where we want to, we have goals and we have ambitions. And I think it all comes down to privacy being about strategy and protection and, and being able at the end of the day to pick and choose what you reveal, um, but also having the knowledge to know, um, you know, in what ways you're willing to give that up. Like Paul was willing to give up. Okay, well, I want a little bit more convenience for a little bit less mobile privacy. Um, and he had, especially being able to go through that experiment of, of having graphene on his phone, he kind of like realized what it was all about and, and, and had more knowledge in coming to like a good decision of like, okay, when I go to an iPhone again, I know what I'm giving up and I know, um, you know, some of the privacy trade-offs there. Because at the end of the day, it just comes down to trade-offs. Yeah, and again... We have literally, like virtually zero privacy right now. So any little step in that direction that you have is, is net positive for sure. Um, and, and Bitcoin as a financial privacy gives us at least the ability, however difficult it may be in some cases, to have financial privacy um, in, a, in a cashless world. Um, something that I want to touch on too, like Ben, you're working at the Bitcoin company. Uh, you're doing some cool stuff with the, with the debit cards, Visa debit cards. You want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, it's pretty, like, we've kind of solved the, like, you know, right now, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you're either using something like BISC or, um, you know, some, like, KYC for you to do it or finding a friend. Normally, it's, like, 99% of people, they just go to, like, Coinbase or Cash App and you give them your ID and you have to buy Bitcoin with, like, full KYC. And selling it is normally the same way. But we've kind of solved it where you don't really need to have KYC to sell your Bitcoin anymore. Or now with us, you can just buy up to $1,000 a Visa debit card um, no KYC, no question, like, we don't need a name or anything. So we have, like, a lot of people who are just, like, you know, oh, I got a, uh, we have a, a friend who um, goes and uh, learns how to fly a plane, and every week he just buys a new Visa card and uses that to buy it, and he just gives them a new name every time, so they don't even know his real name. And they're just like, okay, Jeff, what's your name this week? And, oh, I'm Bob this week. And, you know, he's able to, like, one, it sells Bitcoin without anyone knowing. And um, like, we don't even know, like he tells us he uses this. We don't know what, what his account is or anything like that. You could use a new account every time. And as well, then when he's going to like purchase plane lessons or flight lessons, he just has a card that says, you know, valued customer on it. And, you know, that they, so they can't know his name. And, you know, Visa doesn't know who it is. It's just a random card that, um, uh, that we like issued through like five um, middlemen. So like, there's no way for like anyone to not really know what kind of happened here. So it's a really nice like way to like, you know, you can still like live in the fiat world of like, you know, going to Jimmy John's that, but they don't accept Bitcoin. So you can still like, you know, spend your Bitcoin without having to, and still in a private way without having to just like 
deposit the Coinbase and sell it and then put it on your debit card to swipe it. I mean, I love it more for even um, online things, especially if I'm buying something overseas or you know, I don't want to give up my credit card information, my address, my you know, zip code, all of that to buy things online. Um, you know, and, and the service doesn't accept Bitcoin, then, then I buy these like visa, online Visa cards. Um, you can get the physical version at the Bitcoin company. You can also get the digital virtual version. So like you can instantly, especially if you send lightning in, you send lightning. So like the Bitcoin company doesn't even know where it came from. Like the senders have good privacy on lightning. Um, you send that in instantly you, and then boom, uh, you know, 16 digits appear on the screen and now you have a credit card. Um, it's actually kind of wild. Sometimes it's faster than like going and finding my wallet and figuring out, you know, where I put it and, and pulling out the, the card and typing in all the information. This is a total tangent, but this is one of the things I'm like very bullish on on Bitcoin. Like think of if you've ever sent Bitcoin to somebody, especially if you've ever used Lightning. Like it's so it's so easy compared to typing in a credit card and the little code on the back and your zip code and your address and your phone number. That's just ridiculous. I should just be able to scan a QR code. It's 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 dumb. It, it's so dumb that it like gives me optimism <laughs> that like uh, we have such a better system that we've built completely permissionlessly with so many other great properties. But it's just also easier to use. And on top of that, too, the developer. Part of it is like insane. Like we had lightning payments before I even joined the company because I just took it from another project I had already wow. built versus we've been doing credit card payments like are built for it for like four or five months now and it's a total fucking nightmare. There's like five different, comp five different companies that all have to come together. They're like, oh, we need our fraud detection plus our banking partner plus card issuer and all this. It's, it's a nightmare. And it's just like, there's so much human capital and hours wasted on this stuff that's just like, we could just use an open source library and just be done with it in an hour. But we need to like, you know, have, we literally in our, in the team that does for fraud, there are 10 employees of another company in, our, in the Slack channel and our company is only five employees. It's like, it takes 10 people to do anti-fraud for us to, for, it's double the size of us to build an entire company. It's like, what, what is this happening? Yeah, and, and uh, all three of us have written software that has moved Bitcoin with final, complete, Great settlement, you know. So I don't know how much we've all lost in that process, but I, mean, I have a pretty good record for writing software in that way. But like, if you, how many developers in the world have written software that truly moved money? Like, it's it's really not not that common. Yeah. So not only is it this mindshare of you know this global mindshare contributing to a financial system that benefits everyone on Earth, um, I want to touch on a little bit how we talk about the banking. We talk about how, how everyone here has a bank account, a debit and credit card, but you know, with that being said, like you can have people all over the world that could never dream of having a bank account, never dream of having a debit and credit card, have never been able to interface with any sort of online transaction ever. Um, they are entirely cash based. They now have access to effectively, you know, a Bitcoin bank account with which they can go on the Bitcoin company. They can buy a gift card or a Visa debit card and, you know, interact with the Internet <laughs> payments for the first time ever and that's that's really cool it's, it's been really cool. cool at the bitcoin company like, we have a decently strong brazilian user base for like look at this one guy messaged me all the time he's like oh i bought gas today with the cards and stuff and it's so cool because it's like he doesn't have a bank account but he just has some bitcoin so he's like i'm just gonna live off this and he uses our app like every day and it's like super cool to see like yeah he literally couldn't have a visa card without us and like we're able to provide that for him yeah, I um, I feel very strongly that that sanctions are are immoral, um, and if you think about like I bet I bet Kim Jong Un has a PlayStation Five, you know, like the <laughs> sanctions do not stop the people at the top from getting what they want, right? But the sanctions make potentially you know food security, energy security, like life or death. Um, uh, and, 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 and at, at the hands of the United States and our financial system. Um, and so the, the opportunity with Bitcoin for someone, uh, <laughs> someone to evade those sanctions, which is highly illegal, and we do not condone, <laughs> is a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, I, mean, and, uh, I mean, talking about that, I mean, uh, like even today, um, yeah, Russia, uh, the e EU came out and said that they're, they, they want to make uh, sending any Bitcoin transactions to anyone in Russia 
you know, a sanction, a sanction event, um, which like, you know, they're not going to stop any like non-custodial wallet. So like, if you have your own, like, you know, self-sovereign wallet on your phone, like, you know, they're not going to really know, um, you know, they can check IP addresses and stuff. Then there's some little fuzzy details there, but I mean, in general, no one really knows. And if you spin up a new address, like no one in the world knows where you are, where you're from. And that's kind of why privacy is important too, is so that we can retain the censorship resistance property that like Bitcoin is supposed to all be about. Because once we start getting in this situation where I know you and you know him and, 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 and these organizations know all these addresses, then censorship actually happens. And, um, you know, governments will go after the companies that they have already associated with being Bitcoin businesses and then go after the individuals that have already associated as being Bitcoin individuals. Um, you know, check, you know, and trying to enforce, okay, well, you sent out this transaction, where are they from? Who are they? Um, you know, there's been some laws that have been proposed about like, okay, anyone that sends a Bitcoin transaction, like any wallet, Bitcoin wallet that sends a Bitcoin transaction, that's like over a few hundred bucks um, that, that, that must report all, you know, collect all this personal information about the individual. And it's like, fuck that. Like, we don't have to. Like, all, all I need is an address. Good luck. And I'm going to send a payment. Um, so, and then no one can stop me. So, yeah, it, it, it comes down to, you know, sanctions hurting, um, you know, individuals. The, do you think everyone in Russia is, is terrible? Do you think everyone, every citizen in Russia was responsible for, for like, the decisions of a dictator? Um, I don't think so. So, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, like, uh, you know, real individuals are hurt. Um, you know, by some of these actions. And uh, yeah, we're not saying evade sanctions, but, you know, I would say it's not, it's not unlawful for people in Russia to try to accept money. 100%. Well said. Um, I kind of want to just take it around once more. We have a few minutes left and we maybe can do one or two questions. Um, just kind of closing thoughts and perhaps maybe piggyback one or two things that are, are easy for people to maybe improve their privacy after leaving here today, whether it be Bitcoin or, or just anything, really? I mean, definitely download a, a self-custodial lightning wall. Um, I think what Phoenix was I mentioned earlier, that's beautiful. Um, Moon's great. It's got kind of like different properties. You'll, you'll maybe spend more on fees, but it's, you know, really easy to use Breeze, something like that. Something that doesn't have you enter your name and email address when you set it up. Um, it's just going to, yeah, it's going to generate the, the, the private keys on the device and you're going to be able to, you know, send and receive potentially, um, Samurai for, for on chain, for on -chain. cause it's kind of, kind of help you through some of the UI UX and it kind of helps preserve your privacy. And also it's just play around with it. But yeah. Sorry. I just want to add that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I would say I echo what, what Paul said, but yeah, when you you know take those steps first, and then when you want to to go a little bit more you know privacy focused, self self sovereign and privacy focused, um, and Samurai is a great mobile wallet. Um, also on the desktop wallet, Sparrow is a fantastic wallet. I I think they even do just I think they do the UI best as, as far as any desktop wallet goes. But they also have some of the same functionality that Samurai has called Whirlpool, where you can actually go and coin join transactions. Um, and they make that as easy as possible in, in that desktop wallet. And then for Lightning, you know, uh, I would say download Mutiny Wallet, but it's not available yet. So uh, <laughs> two weeks or uh, no? No, no, no <laughs> <laughs> We have it on our phones, and it works on mainnet, but it's not it's not ready for uh, public consumption. Um, next week, download Lightning Vortex and start using that. But uh, otherwise, yeah, throw out your Alexa and Google Home and. Any of that crap, delete Facebook, probably delete Twitter, all those other things, de Google yourself. Like, I mean, basically to try to self host everything you can. It gets harder, like, you know, there was like a Hacker News post like a week ago or two weeks ago about a guy who had been running his own email server for like 23 years and he finally gave up because of, you know, just the world's gotten too hard for it. And uh, it's hard. So, like, yeah, like be, be ready to fail. Like, it, it, like, like Paul talked about with his iPhone, like, I'm a, iPhone cup I'm still too. doing graphene. Hey so Siri. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, it's okay to to like fail, but like still try to do your best and like just always be pushing that ball forward because like it, like if you lose your privacy, you can't get it back. So like you know like if, if it's if if you leak something, it's not you can't like unhide that. And 
maybe it's okay today, but tomorrow it might not be. So just always be conscious of that. Yeah, in some sense, a lot of these systems of control are contingent upon us, like, being lazy. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, this is something I've been thinking a lot about. Like, you know, we, a lot of people complain about, like, uh, the, the, the tracking that Facebook does and the censorship on, like, social media um, and all these problems, the algorithms on TikTok and China spying on you. We complain about all these things, but there, I, I remember an internet where people had their own websites. You know, it, it, it has, that technology never went away where you can build something and put it up. It's just harder than posting a tweet. Uh, and so people go for the easier solution, but we never lost the technology. And in fact, the technology has gotten so much better than it used to be to host a website. So there are a lot of like uh, self-sovereign solutions to technology things. They just take a little bit more. Sometimes they take a lot more work <laughs> and, and you will fail, but sometimes they just take a little bit more work. Um, but these companies are so kind of dependent on or, or expecting us that we'll just never even try at all. Um, and that's kind of where they win. Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys, I salute you for trying to make the hard things easier in your own ways and pushing the boundaries of that. Um, give a round of applause guys. That, that really, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for coming out tonight and all of you as well. Um, we can open it up to maybe a couple questions. Don't be shy. I'm going to pass you the mic. Any questions? That's that. Uh, um, so recently, like a month ago, chain analysis raised like over a hundred million dollars, like an $8.6 billion valuation, which is insane because their whole business model is based off of tracking Bitcoin transactions and transactions on other blockchains. So I'm just wondering, is it possible, is there a future where we can invalidate that business model and what would it take to get there? Make every spend a coin join? I mean, I think like their business model is off like lies. Like they, they, they just go to exchanges and other regulated entities and say like, you need us. Like there is no law that you need chain analysis. There is no law that you need to be tracking like on-chain stuff. They just tell companies you need us and then their compliance officer gets scared and purchases it. And so they don't need this, like their analysis could be completely wrong, but they will still buy it because it's, it's just a scam. So, I mean, I don't think it'll ever be invalidated. It'll just become eventually just like we won't have these KYC exchanges anymore. People will just be using Bitcoin, so it won't matter anymore. That's my hope, but uh, I yeah, don't know. One interesting aspect to that as well, um, saying like it's not illegal not to have chain analytics status as a regulated company. Um, it does get to a point where there is some... Uh, area where if you are a business operating, um, you know, as, as something like Coinbase, right, or other exchanges, and you're not doing the things that all the other exchanges are doing as far as compliance, they almost kind of use this group effect. I, I used to work at an exchange as well. They almost use this group effect of like, you're going out of the norm. Why are you going out of the norm? You know, we're going to consider this unlawful. We're not going to approve your application. Just do everything everyone else did. But they, they uh, compliance-wise, they never... They never say what people should do or should not do. They give recommendations and everyone, and, and because everyone's trying to launch a company, right, and get approvals, there's so much paperwork, there's so much hassle. It's just so much easier to over comply, get the paperwork that they need to get, sign the papers that they need to sign. Um, and what, what it comes down to is once you as a company, um, you know, sign all this compliance paperwork and say what you're gonna do or not gonna do, that's what they use against you if you go outside of those bounds. So if you said you were going to do this compliance, um, it doesn't matter if Coinbase is doing it or not or some other exchange is not doing that um, because it typically comes down to um, they didn't say they would and they still got the application filed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tricky business dealing with, with anything like FinCEN compliance related because, uh, you know, sometimes these companies just want to, right and do whatever they need to do just to launch their company yeah let's well, say at the bitcoin company we have a compliance officer and uh, teaching him about lightning was a magical moment where he was like wait where's the transactions i'm like i don't know i don't know where the big money came from and he was just like <laughs> oh fuck like <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, that, is a, that was like a very like, reassuring moment for me. I was like, oh, lightning kind of works. Like, we don't know our, where our users' money's come from. Yeah, you can imagine a future of Bitcoin uh, where it's just like these big uh, coin join transactions that pop back up as lightning channels, and then they go back down as big coin joins, and they pop pop up as lightning channels. Most of the economic activity happens up on lightning and the on-chain is just more about like moving the capital around in some weird financial system that we're kind of inventing right now. Thank you. Yeah. So um, you talk about the concept of uh, like a self-sovereign website, right? Say you have a website and you publish content. Um, how do you solve the tension between you need LinkedIn or Twitter to market your content, um, you know, cheaply, right? So you, there are channels that you can market your content in a more expensive you know, let's say you have a soft sovereign website, like how do you market it without, you know, incurring huge fees and without using like a Twitter or in or, you know, like, you know, the other. Right. Google Analytics and, and all that SEO and stuff. Yeah, I don't I, I, I know, Paul, you had to go through this recently. So uh, nobody will ever know about your website. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's an exciting like uh, social media alternative, a uh, um, uh, Noster that's emerging. I'm excited about that. I do think eventually we will figure out a decentralized Twitter. Um, but yeah, that, that would completely be a problem. Um, you can still use those. Um, in some sense, if, if you, I mean, w one thought maybe along those lines is if you think of a lot of people who like blow up and become very popular on a platform like Twitter or YouTube or Facebook, and then get unplatformed, they might lose their audience. But if they use those platforms as a promoting, like if you see the popularity of Substack right now, um, or especially over the past couple of years, um, where they're promoting their content um, on those platforms, but they had people coming over to a platform, they don't fully own this, um, but, but people were landing on a, a platform that was not censoring them. So when they would get banned on Twitter it would become a call to action and they get more subscriptions. Um, so I think people are learning to be a little more anti-fragile from that censorship, but I think as much as possible, whenever possible, if you can own the publishing platform, it's just, it's, it's so much more powerful. And I think there is an aspect of um, where these are these kind of vertical siloed walled gardens, like LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, they're all like separate and they don't seem to interoperate very well and that's because they they those companies have no incentives to work together but i think when we see these self-sovereign platforms come up uh, they will have lots of interplay and, and interlink and interconnection and so eventually things maybe will be able to go even better viral once we truly build a, like a better version of the internet because we don't you as an individual with your own site don't have an uh, incentive to keep LinkedIn and YouTube and all those things separated. You want th those to be linked together to, to create a network of people finding you. I have a little bit of a different answer. It's just like delete all your social media and make the things that you make so good that all your friends and everyone market it for you. So <laughs> On social media. <laughs> on social media. Yeah, on their social media. Uh, yeah, so you don't have to endure that. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of echo more of Paul's point. Like, social media is a tool. Use it as such. Like, you know, if you, if, like, like the Bitcoin company, like, we try to be sovereign and private and stuff. But, like, we have a Facebook account. We have a Twitter account. We have all that stuff. Why? Because we want users and to make money. So that's where, you know, that's the way to do it is by promoting it on where everyone else is. So I don't, like, I think, like, for promotion, it's perfectly fine to do that, but don't use it as like, it, like don't try to use Twitter as or Facebook as like, oh, I'm gonna post all my family photos on here. Like that's that can be dangerous. But using it as just like, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to like you know make the world better. Here's you know buy my stuff and you know it's all be better for it. That's a perfectly fine use of the tool, I think. Thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you.